Hey everybody. I know it's kind of ironic that it's like reactive JavaScript and then you have to write less JavaScript. You can still write reactive JavaScript. It's very good. So hi. Hi. I'm, uh, I'm Caleb Borzio. I'm a freelance full stack developer out of Buffalo. I write web apps with Laravel and Vue. I write blog posts over here. I tweet there. And I record things there. Podcast. Every Friday with my buddy, Daniel. It's a good time. And this is me climbing a mountain, joking. Um, JavaScript. I want to talk about JavaScript, particularly my ascent of JavaScript mountain, and then back down again a little bit. Uh, just for some data here, who who has used or is familiar with an MVC framework like Rails or Laravel? Like, who has that in their history? Okay, gotcha. Now, who uses one of the big three frameworks like Vue, React, or Angular? All right, sounds good. So I'm going to cover three things on my trail up and down the mountain, three turning points in the way I write my front ends, and two of them I imagine you'll share in common, and the third one maybe not. So imagine we have to write some input element where you're typing into it and you want it to show up below it, right? Let's go back in time. So back in the day day, I would have wrote this in jQuery, and uh, so for jQuery, I would get the input element, put it inside a variable, and then set a listener for the input event so that everybody, every time a user types a key, I can react to that event and set the span value to that text value. Does that look familiar to anybody? Like the jQuery paradigm? Yeah, you're binding up event listeners everywhere. And this is how I got there. This is how I got that. Just a script tag. All I needed was add a script tag, a simple JavaScript file to the page, and then I was off to the races. And I call this JavaScript sprinkles because it's still an MVC application. I have like, you know, my back end is uh, doing all the templating and returning static HTML, and then I'm just sprinkling in JavaScript wherever I need dynamic interaction. So the first turning point, I, uh, I've been hearing a lot of hype about Angular, and I thought, why don't I check this out for myself? So I went to Angular's website, and I saw this. And this totally blew my mind. And this does exactly the same thing as the jQuery did. It just, you don't have to write all that JavaScript. So here it is, the first uh, ng model. This is Angular for when the input element changes, I want you to set this title property on the component to whatever the value of that input element is. And then anywhere else in your template, you can reference that property called title, and it'll update automatically. So this is totally declarative, meaning we're like, we're declaring an outcome. We're not setting a list of actions, like if this, then that. We're saying this is how we want the state of things to be. And this was total, This was an obvious improvement. Like as soon as I saw this, I was like, this changes everything for me. And uh, so fast forward a little bit. Angular is kind of a steep learning curve. So when I got into Vue, Vue is a little bit easier. And I went pretty hard into Vue. So I'll show you what this template looks like in Vue.js. I know. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Yeah, so that's Vue. And, uh, but it was still sprinkles. I'm still just sprinkling JavaScript around my applications with the script tag. And anything that I had in jQuery before, I'm just converting over to Vue components. And my life was still fairly simple. Still an MVC app. The MVC is the donut, and the sprinkles are the JavaScript. Um, so thing number two. This is when everything just completely blew up, when everything hit the fan. And I think this changed the JavaScript ecosystem in the way we interact with front ends forever. And it's two words. Have I piqued your interest? <laughs> NPM install. Yeah, the two words that changed everything. So before, you would go, like, the JavaScript ecosystem consisted of jQuery and jQuery plugins. And now it's totally not that way. And when you went to an install, like, you went to the readme and you saw the install instructions, it showed you, like, a download this file. Or, like, here's the CDN. It was such a simpler time. And now it says npm install foo, whatever you're trying to install. And what happens when you npm install something? Like, what even happens? So if you're a newcomer into the space, where before the on-ramp was nice and gradual, you just download the file, you include, you could use Notepad and do this stuff. Now it says npm install, so you have to be familiar with the command line. And then where does it go? Node modules, and there's a bazillion folders in there, and maybe you dig through and you find your file. It's just completely different. This, this implies that you have a build. You need a build process, some sort of bundler, to use the things you're downloading, and it's probably Webpack. And if you've ever had to configure Webpack, you know the craziness. And Parcel, or Rollup, or Browserify, or Grunt, or Gulp, or all of these things that you need. And now instead of our little sprinkles on top of our little MVC app, 
The whole freaking thing is sprinkles. It's all sprinkles, everything. So I found myself where my templates were moving into the front end. That like before I was doing all the templating on the back end, returning static HTML. Now it's like everything's JavaScript. All my templating is the front end, and my back end is just returning JSON. And for for anybody coming into the space right now, I'm saying this, and you're going, you're, this is like a history lesson because that's just kind of the way the landscape is like. Well, yeah, well, back ends return JSON, and front ends render everything. The spa. So basically, I found myself writing single page applications, and the idea is that. The, the server returns the first static HTML set, and then the JavaScript takes over from there and handles all the, um, all the templating from there, and then your backend just returns JSON. So the spot is more expensive than you think. I knew you already thought it was expensive, but it is more expensive than you think. You're managing two code bases now. So before, if you were working in a Rails app, you had to deal with Ruby, and now you have to deal with Ruby and JavaScript. And like I said, it's not just like the JavaScript where you have a function or two. This is like fully object-oriented, TypeScript, transpiled, tested everything, code splitted, tree shaken, everything. You have glue code to glue the two pieces together, so every feature spans across two code bases. And you probably have a REST API in between, and you have to test that, and you have to authenticate with that with JWT tokens, and maybe you're using GraphQL, and you have to write like these tests that do contract tests between those API endpoints, and restricted templates. So before, in like a PHP template, you could do anything you wanted. Like you could call into the database directly from a template because it's backend code. You do whatever you want to do. In the front end, you can't do that. So things like authorizing, you know, hidden areas like becomes a lot more complex when all your templates live in the front end. And state management woe. State, that's that word that just keeps flying around everywhere. And it's it's a scary word. And if you've ever been into the, if you've ever like built apps with React or Vue, you get into this, you know, you have all these components everywhere, but they need to talk to each other. So you pass props down, you listen to events up, but then that, like, that, that breaks down over time and you end up prop drilling and you have events flying everywhere. So they say, oh, well, use Redux or, oh, use Vuex. And if you've ever used them, you know that's not a simple thing. You end up in this, this whole other mess of things. So this is me, a picture of me staring out my window, <laughs> asking myself, is it all worth it? Did, I just needed to show a modal. Like, I just needed a date picker. And I wound up, like, swimming and drowning in this, this build JavaScript craziness. So front end needs exist on a spectrum, like anything. On the one end, you have a CRUD app with some forms and a table or two. And on the other end, you have Gmail, or something that needs to be offline capable, or Figma, like, that uses WebAssembly. And if you're like me, you're probably somewhere in the middle. And I think our, our tools should match our needs. And right now we're using Vue, Angular, and React for everything. And anybody coming into the space is like, well, yeah, that's what you build front ends with. It doesn't have to be that way. So my question is, what exists out there in the middle space? What's out there for people who, who want a little bit more smooth, dynamic UIs than just full page reloads, but don't necessarily want to wade into that, that deep, deep ocean of, uh, of NPM install land? So this brings me to my third point. This is a technique that I came across from the Rails community um, a couple years ago. A couple years ago, and sort of a, the best way to demonstrate this is a simple, humble JavaScript property that you may have seen before. Dot inner HTML. Has anybody seen dot inner HTML before? It's this humble JavaScript property. You can tag it onto something. You can say div dot inner HTML, and it'll spit out the HTML, or you can set it and the browser will set the innards of that div to that HTML. So you've probably seen it in like kind of a hacky context. It always feels like a band-aid. But consider this approach applied in this scenario. So this is Axios. It's a package to make a, a, a fetch a Ajax request. So we're going to set, uh, we're going to make a call to a, an endpoint, the foo endpoint, make a get request. And typically when you see this kind of thing, when you're making an Ajax call, you're almost always getting back JSON. Right? You get back JSON, and then you do the templating in the front end with your view component or Angular component. What, what, what happens if we return HTML from an AJAX request? And with that HTML, we do div.innerHTML. So that the back end's doing the templating, and the front end's just kind of dumb. It's just taking the new template and putting it into the page. So let's, uh, let's do some live coding here. <coughs> whoop, whoop, whoop. All right. Oh, so many noises. Okay, so I'm going to show this to you in action. So here is a sample application. 
It's a, it's a basic like dummy account dashboard that I made. So you have account, profile, and invoices. So pretty straightforward stuff. And then this is a Laravel app. Laravel is just like Rails um, or Django or Express. It's a MVC full stack application. Here's the routes file. There's three routes. There's invoice, profile, and account. So um, is, is dark theme okay? Should I do light theme? I'll, I'll show you light theme and then Light is way better. Now, which light? Should we go through each one? <laughs> is this good enough? The other one's better? Okay. It's so much uglier, though. Ew. Okay. So, invoice, profile, account. And like I said, this is model view controller at its best. Like, here's the view, this invoice view, and we're passing it some data that we're getting out of the database. This invoice model from the database, and we're paginating it. And let's check out that view. So here's the view. It's called invoice.blade. And this is Blade. It's a templating language in PHP. So it's, this is basically PHP. Um, and we're for reaching through the invoices. And we're listing a bunch of divs. And there's a heading tag here with invoices. So this is spitting out this whole page. Nice. And um, there's also a test that I wrote. So I can show you kind of like how I would write a test for this. Oh, that's not it. OK. So here's a test, can see invoices. So one of the benefits of using a backend framework, but backend tests are really fast, especially if you're just testing HTML output. You don't have to have a whole browser. If you've ever gotten into like Selenium or Cypress or acceptance testing like that, it's crazy. And those tests are slow and really hard to maintain. So I'll run this test and you'll see what I'm talking about. Here's a test that just passed. It just did everything I needed to do, no browser. And what it did, so I, I create the thing in the database. I create this invoice called foo. And then I, I hit the endpoint, the invoice endpoint. That's this one right here. And then I assert that I see foo. And it creates a testing database every time I run this test and it destroys it. So it's quick and it's magical and it's great. And I don't want to lose that. OK. So let's go back to the routes file. And let's pretend that we're getting these invoices from Stripe or a third party <laughs> API. And this is actually uh, the first time I used this technique that I'm about to show you. The first time I actually used it was this exact example. I was working on a dashboard, and I needed to make an invoice page, and I had to pull them from Stripe. And it took like two seconds. So let's make it take two seconds. <laughs> OK. Yeah, so all right, so here's the, <laughs> here's the account page. Uh, you're so happy. I, I love the feedback here. Um, account page, profile page, everything's quick. But then I go to invoices, and we're hanging for two seconds. Unacceptable UX. So I want to lazy load these invoices. I want to show the user something, like a loading spinner. And then when it's done, I want to show the invoices. And so my knee-jerk reaction to solve something like this would be, well, I'll make a view component or a React component. And then in a lifecycle hook, like the created hook, I'll call out to the server, get some JSON of the invoices after two seconds, and then render the template and hide the loading spinner. So let's see if we can not do that and not use JavaScript, kind of. I notice it's write less JS. We still need JS. OK. So let's hop into our invoice template here. All right, this is where we're looping through the invoices. We're just going to kill this completely. All right, we're going to pull this out into a separate file. I'm going to call this invoice partial.lay.php. OK. And there we go. And then in its place, I'm going to put a loading spinner. Here is a spinner. OK. And now, if I reload the page, it should take, still it's going to take two seconds, and then it's just going to load a loading spinner. Here we go. And loading spinner. And it's just going to hang forever. So I want to make a separate endpoint for this invoice partial so that we can see all the HTML loaded on it. So right now it doesn't exist. Let's create it. OK. So I'm going to copy this route here. And we'll create a route called invoice partial. And then we can kill this stuff because we're just loading a, a dumb loading spinner. We don't need to know anything about invoices yet. And then here's our invoice partial. And then we'll update the view to invoice partial. OK. And we're almost there. Last thing to do is we want to replace the contents of this with .inner HTML with the contents of that, uh, that endpoint. So let's just add the JavaScript the old-fashioned way. Axios dot get and then invoice partial dot get. So we make oh not dot get dot then. We get the response back. And we will use dot inner HTML. But first we need to get 
this element, so I'll add an ID called invoices. Okay, and then document dot query selector. Does anybody remember dot get element by ID? Yeah. yeah. Right? I shiver when I say that. <laughs> okay. Okay, and then we'll just set the response. So is everybody tracking here? This is sort of what I've been describing. We're firing off an AJAX request, we made an endpoint that gives us HTML, and we're gonna shove it in and replace the content. So the loading spinner is just gonna disappear into oblivion. So, so if I refresh this page, we'll see that, that uh, HTML, because this is the partial page. Okay, demo gods. All right, awesome. So. Now it's loading and it's deferred loading. So this in itself is like pretty great. Like just this alone. Like we wrote a couple lines of JavaScript and we kept our template in the back end. And so let's go back to that test really quick. The test is gonna fail now. We run it, it says, hey, failed asserting that this loading spinner contains what we want it to contain. So we'll just update the endpoint that we're calling to the partial and we should be passing. Nice. So this is actually, uh, it seem, maybe it seems insignificant, but to me, this is one of the most significant advantages of this approach, is I can still have all my templating under my PHP tests, which are fast, and I can access the database from them and do all sorts of fun stuff. Okay, so that's that. Let's, um, let's check out a tool, it's called Intercooler, that uh, kind of does this for us. So Intercooler.js is a project. Um, who's heard of Intercooler? One per yeah, okay, I figured there would be probably nobody. It's not very popular, but um, but it's a tried and true. It used basically is built on this tactic. So check this out. Here's Intercooler. If I click on this button, it's going to replace the contents with whatever it gets back. So Intercooler uses these attributes. So IC stands for Intercooler. So Intercooler send a POST request to click, and it's going to there's an implicit on click. And then when that happens, it's just going to replace the A tag with whatever it gets back. So it's super simple, and it's just sprinkles. So let's use Intercooler for this. So I'm going to go to my layout here. This is the main like layout template of, uh, of every page. So you have an HTML tag, a head tag, and all I have to do is add that intercooler.js. Okay? And then now let's use Intercooler instead of this approach. So Intercooler get from, and this is like saying make a get request to, invoice partial, okay? And then I see trigger on is intercooler when to trigger this. And you could say click or a bunch of other things. We'll say load. So on load, make a get request to there. And then intercooler will automatically replace the contents of this div with the partial. And now we can kill our script. Load it up. And with any luck, nice. So this achieved the same thing. Thank you. Um, all right, so let's see if we can push this actually one step further. And so right now it's paginating, it's giving us the most five recent invoices. So let's add a little show button, a show more button, that when we click on it, it loads the next set of results. So more intercooler magic. Let's go to inter invoice partial. And I have a little snippet here called show more. So this is pretty simple. It's a div with some styling and a show more button. All right, so let's see what this looks like. All right, so here's our show more button, but it doesn't work at all right now. We click it and nothing happens. So we can just add intercooler attributes to make it happen. So I see get from, oops, invoice partial, okay. I see trigger on, and this time we wanna trigger on the click. And then one more little one we need, I see replace target, which is essentially outer HTML. We don't really have to worry about it right now. Um, but let's refresh, refresh this and see what we get. Okay, so we have show more, and I click it, wait two seconds, and there we go. We received a new set of data. But it's the same exact set of invoices, we never specified the next page. So Laravel makes pagination crazy easy. Um, you just add page and then, and then a number, and it'll give you the next page. So to actually specify the next page, I'm gonna write a little bit of Blade, a little bit of Laravel, you don't have to quite understand exactly what it does, but we say get the page out of the request. If you don't have it, default to the first page and then go to the next page. Okay. And now we refresh, wait two seconds. I hit show more and I should get the next page of invoice results. All right, there we go. So now it's August. Cool. We can keep doing that. So we're almost there, but there's no visual feedback that it's thinking. There's no loading spinner. There's no loading indicator. 
So let's add a little loading indicator. So I'm going to make a span tag, give it an ID of loading, make it hidden by default. Okay, there's our dot dot dot. Now there's a, an intercooler attribute called IC indicator. Oops. And then you just pass in a CSS selector, and intercooler will automatically, if it'll find the element and it'll remove display none. Okay? Refresh, hit show more, and there we go. So now we have visual feedback. You could make this a spinner, you could gray things out, and we have this, um, this extra functionality. So, pretty cool. Uh, we're, we're getting there. Uh, I want to show you one more tool. So, there's a tool called TurboLinks. It's really popular in the Rails community. Who's heard of TurboLinks? A couple more hands. Nice. Still not like crazy popular across the board, but uh, it's pretty awesome. So, TurboLinks makes navigating your web application faster. That's so vague. <laughs> Get the performance benefits of a single page application without the added complexity of client side JavaScript framework. When you follow a link, TurboLinks automatically fetches the page, swaps in the body, and merges its head. All right. So what TurboLinks does, basically, it is actually magic. If I'm right here, let's pretend that we're on a slow internet connection. We'll just pretend. We'll make it a little bit slower. Okay. So we're on a slow internet connection, and we switch pages, and oh, it's just so slow. So when you add TurboLinks, TurboLinks, it basically like goes out and it finds all the link tags, all the A tags, and it hijacks them, and it intercepts those requests, and instead of letting it do a full browser refresh, it'll fetch that stuff over Ajax. So basically what we've been doing, and it'll take the HTML it gets back and do some dot inner HTML to replace the contents of the body. It also does some extra fanciness, but that's the gist. So let me show you what I mean and how to use it. And it's the easiest thing to implement ever. This is how you add TurboLinks to your project. Are you ready? Okay, TurboLinks added. <laughs> now I hit profile, oh we had to refresh the page, okay. So notice there's no loading wheel anymore. And TurboLink stores a cached version of the last visit, so it actually looks instant, even though we're on a 3G connection. So check that out. And then we get this little like loading flash up top. So it feels like a single page application, and it's just a silly old MVC application. It's beautiful. Um, yeah, all right, so that's pretty good. And then I click on invoices, and check this out. Like We have a very JavaScript feeling application here. And we just went from a very classic server side application. So pretty cool. And it all is built on that like dot inner HTML kind of principle. So but this is this is the kind of approach that, you know, like big companies wouldn't use this. Like important projects would not use something like this because it's just for small projects and it's just for people who, you know, aren't smart enough to know enough JavaScript. Right? No, wrong. Meta example. GitHub uses this kind of thing all over the place. So if I switch tabs over GitHub, just go to Issues, it feels like you're in an SPA. But, oh, I'm still on that fast. No, nope, I'm not on the fast 3G. This is just the internet. <laughs> All right. Here we are. All right, let's refresh. Come on now. I think the internet is broken. Okay. I hit the code tab. This is not happening. All right, well, I'll just describe to you what would happen. In a normal scenario, all right, so check out what happened. In the background, it sent off this, this Ajax request, and it's getting no response. Did it get one? It got one. Nice. So basically, it uses TurboLinks. It's not exactly TurboLinks. It's PJAX. GitHub created it, and TurboLinks was kind of built off of it. But GitHub, every time you switch pages, it does this. It fetches it over Ajax. It takes all the HTML, and it swaps it in. And as you navigate GitHub, you'll see this kind of thing is used all over the place. Oh, I'm doing this again. Um, I wish I had a, like a stock joke to tell you. Um, I, I had a step ladder. I never knew my real ladder. <laughs> all right. We're still waiting. OK. So I'll, I guess I'll just show you the gist here. When you hover over stuff on GitHub, it sends Ajax requests out the wazoo. Close your dev tools and I'll go faster. Is that right? It says no throttling. Oh, did disable caching or something? It's reporting your network traffic. Okay. All right. Here we go. 
So watch me hover over this author dropdown. Bam, Ajax request. What did it return? HTML, Caleb Porzio, Carlos Santonio, and check this out. When I click on it, it's just showing all that HTML that it just got. So every time I hover over anything, there's an Ajax request being sent out to get this stuff. So GitHub uses this all over the place. I have one more example, but it may not be in the cards for us today. We'll see. All right, I don't know why that was so slow. All right, well, you get the idea. GitHub uses it. Does it scale? Does GitHub scale? No. <laughs> yeah, of course. All right, so and this is the other one. When you hit transfer issue on an issue, it shows a modal. There's no JavaScript for this modal. It's an HTML only modal, which is pretty bonkers. It uses this tag called details and summary in HTML5. So GitHub is like, as I started to dive into GitHub, I found they're like supremely dedicated to this craft of not using JavaScript, which is pretty cool. And so choose repository and I search, say a bunch of gibberish, and there's a loading wheel. That's also just CSS. And the search results come back as HTML. No repositories match, no repositories match. So it's not returning JSON and then rendering a template, it's doing the templating on the back end. Okay, pretty sweet stuff. Back to the deck. Takeaways. Spas are expensive, super duper expensive. Just realize the cost you're incurring when you go into something like that. Those big frameworks, Vue, Angular, they're all great for certain things, just like any tool. Um, keep your needs in mind. Start with the needs. What are your needs? Do you need to show a modal? There's a bunch of ways to show a modal pretty easily. Um, and embrace minimal tactics like fetching HTML instead of JSON over Ajax requests, because you can, and there's no reason you have to do JSON. So with this, I leave you. Be more productive and write less JS. Thank you.